Hollywood has never been kind in its portrayal of business people, and that's doubly true when it comes to the deal makers, those heartless, wing-tipped, pinstriped brokers who see finance as blood sport and workers as pawns. Think Gordon Gecko in Wall Street or Richard Gere in Pretty Woman. In American Psycho, Christian Bale took the stereotype to new lows, playing a high-flying banker who specialized in mergers and acquisitions during the day and morphed into a murdering sociopath in the evening. Fortunately, there are no such villains to be found in real-life mergers, but there can be a lot of drama and, depending on the firms involved, a lot of headlines. Leading firms through a merger is a complex, daunting, and emotionally charged undertaking. The stakes are high, and careers and livelihoods often hang in the balance. But done well, the results can lead to a happy ending for all involved. Today on Cold Call, we welcome Professor David Fubini to discuss the case entitled Merging American Airlines and U.S. Airways. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call on the HBR Presents Network. David Fabini teaches in the MBA and executive education programs at Harvard Business School. Before teaching, he had a long career at McKinsey Consulting, where he helped clients with major transformation programs stemming from acquisitions and mergers, which is perfect for today's conversation. And he is the author of Hidden Truths, What Leaders Need to Hear But Are Rarely Told. David, maybe you'll tell them some of that stuff today during our conversation. Great to have you back. Great to be back. And thank you for having me back. Very much appreciate the opportunity. The last time we met, we were talking about the Big Apple Circus and creepy clowns and stuff. So I thought I would start out with just a nod to American Psycho in the beginning of this one. Indeed, you did. Thankfully, I'm none of those things by vocation or by looks. Nonetheless, great setting. Yeah, it sells movies, but it's not really true to life, I think, which is great. So. Not true to life, no. Maybe you can start just by telling us, what would your cold call be to start this case in the classroom? Well, a cold call would be, is this a merger of equals or is this a takeover? Because this is a little bit of both. Therein lies the debate. Takeover, because this was an acquisition of American Airlines by U.S. Airways out of bankruptcy. So you don't get any more hostile than that one because, of course, American had hoped to emerge from bankruptcy following its own plan. U.S. Airways thought otherwise. So from that context, it's clearly a takeover. On the other hand, no way you can actually take over such a big airline being such a small airline as the U.S. Airways was. So in many ways, it has to be a merger. It has to be a merger in every dimension because there's so many pieces that have to be put together. So students should have to ask, well, which is it? Why was it important to you to write this case? And more importantly, how does it relate to the ideas in your book? This case uh, came about because uh, David Garvin, who, of course, we've lost, was just a pillar of this place. And, the, and it was a great opportunity to be able to write a case with David. And he wanted to talk about the process of putting together a merger and acquisition properly. There are many, many books and, and for that matter, cases written about mergers. But David thought, and, and I thought it would be a great thing to help him actually illustrate in a much more definitive way the trade-offs that go into a merger process. So that was really the uh, the genesis of the case. Why it's important to my book is because why well, Doug Parker is certainly not a new CEO to the U.S. Airways folks. He is certainly a very new CEO to the American Airlines folks and therefore mm-hmm. has to apply many of the lessons learned that come in this book about the hidden truths. Because for many CEOs taking over a new organization, they're like a brand new CEO, and they do face all those hidden truths that I try to illustrate in the book. And you saw how many of these when you were working at McKinsey? How many? You probably don't have the exact number, but a lot, I'm going to guess. A lot. I probably was involved in as many as uh, 50 major transactions of some note, uh, also involved in a fair number of divestitures as well, how you actually roll out something from an organization as opposed to rolling in something to an organization. So why don't you uh, just set the stage for us? What led up to the discussions about the merger? First of all, we should note that in the American Airlines industry, every major airline had been through bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. American Airlines had held off. It had been the last remaining airline to not slip into bankruptcy, but it couldn't eventually uh, avoid the fate that had fallen to others. U.S. Airways has always wanted to acquire and become a bigger airline, and they saw in the bankruptcy of American an opportunity to really pounce and did so. So that was the foundational element of the of the deal itself. The reason for a lot of this consolidation is because, as we've observed in the airline industry, there's real value in having scale, and scale was really important, and also because U.S. Airways wanted to apply its approach to managing an airline to a broader airline. And so they saw this as a real opportunity as well. That's the institutional view. 
the individual view here is also important. Doug Parker started his career at American. Oh. Had worked in the finance operation, actually worked alongside of the chairman of American Airlines. They were colleagues. He had always eyed American Airlines as, as a possible airline he would love to own because he had actually begun there. How often does it happen in the reverse order, I guess, with the, the little fish gobbling the big fish? It's rare because it's very difficult, one, to convince shareholders that this is a good thing to do yeah. because of the scale differences. Then there's the capital formation questions, which are obviously always challenging And when you're talking about the scale differences. Uh, and finally, it's really hard to actually outbid a, a larger company for an a asset if you are the smaller company. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Doug. You mentioned that he worked at American Airline early on. What, you know, how did he come into his role at U.S. Airways, and and sort of what's his leadership style? Well, he had been uh, the, the CEO of U.S. Airways for some time, actually, ever since they bought America West. If you're old enough to remember that, that there was a, a former airline indeed called America I am. West. Yes, indeed, <laughs> it was, we, many of us are. And U.S. Airways itself is a product of lots of other airlines being rolled up. So both of these are all products of, of, of other consolidations. Doug had taken over as, as the head of U.S. Airways, and one, he's remarkably smart and obviously incredibly engaging, uh, but he has a very low-key approach to um, being a CEO, not like the Hollywood version of the sort of all-seeing, all-knowing, you know, sitting on a pedestal type CEO. That's not Doug. Doug is very down-to-earth, loves talking to everybody in the building from the person who might be at the front desk greeting people to uh, his most senior executives. So he was a very open, engaging very informal in his approach and in his style with people, which played very well in the airline industry, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. But that sets up sort of an interesting dynamic because the case does a good job of talking about the differences and sort of the personalities of the two companies, right? Right. So American Airlines is kind of the antithesis of what you just described. It is indeed in many ways. First of all, American Airlines viewed themselves, uh, maybe rightfully so, as sort of the airline of the Americas. I mean, it was like it was America's airline. It was the representative of business travels and travelers everywhere, and it viewed itself as such. It was quite proud and internally ran itself in a very, very hierarchical way committee on top of committee on top of committee, and then eventually to the senior executives. Things move quite slowly, really driven by marketing and branding more so than operations. Mm -hmm. I would say that U.S. Airways was just the opposite of all of that. So you have two radically different cultures, and then you have a scale difference as well when you're doing the acquisition, and you can see that this would be a big challenge. And we'll get into some of those differences a little bit further on in our conversation. But let's start at least, if you can describe the issues that Parker found himself contending with as he's starting to move down this path to, to the merger. The very first largest challenge is one of um, scale. I mean, that just it is truly, and we discussed it as being the minnow trying to eat the whale. Just the scale differences were quite significant. If you think about the number of anything between city pair routings to number of planes and different planes that uh, American had in their fleet than that of U.S. Airways, you'd understand just how radically different and challenging this would be when you look at the scale differences between the two. Yeah. Second, the culture of running the airlines were quite different, as we were just already indicating. American Airlines was very focused on customer service and its uh, service to business travelers in particular. For example, it was quite famous for the fact that it allowed its captains to hold the plane if indeed it felt it was appropriate to accommodate a business traveler or a set of travelers who might be coming in on an airline that had been delayed, and so therefore they would hold the plane. U.S. Airways was, no, we fly when it said we're going to fly and not a minute later, because their theory was that they ran such a tight network that a 10-minute delay at the beginning of the day would turn out to be a two-and-a-half-hour delay by the end of the day, and they were probably right. Nonetheless, you have this incredible difference in operational philosophy between the two. So that's the second major challenge. And the third is dealing with the sheer volume of transactional decisions that have to be made when you think about putting together airlines. Just think about it for a moment, and we understand just how complicated they can be from what we observe. Then you have to think about all the things you can't observe that are also very complicated, not the least of which is the questions around things that you don't often think about, like cargo, for example. Mm -hmm. Cargo is a huge part of the airline, and yet you really don't ever think about it. But merging the cargo parts of it on top of the passenger part is really quite difficult. The sheer preponderance of issues here on an airline are pretty dramatic, even more so than a make-and-sell business. 
So in your experience, how complicated is it to sustain a business while you're going through a merger like this? How do you continue to operate as if things are normal? We always use that expression of fixing the plane while it's in flight. I guess it's apropos here. It is apropos here. <laughs> it's incredibly apropos here and incredibly tough. It's probably the number one challenge in the work that I used to do uh, advising companies on on their mergers is how to actually make sure that during the time of post the announcement pre the regulatory approval process, which can be as long as six months, how do you actually maintain your base business and not have it suffer? And the truth is it's ridiculously difficult because the norm for most uh, organizations as they're going through a transaction for them to lose focus on their base business and have, frankly, their revenue drop. Why is because, one, there's something called the shiny object phenomena, which is everybody wants to be involved in that, which is going on, which is the new thing, which is the merger. That takes time and attention away from the base business. So the first thing you have to do is to tell everybody is do your job. Yeah. And don't worry about the merger. Some of us will worry about that on your behalf. That's a very difficult message for some. Second, every competitor out there knows that you're going through this process and there's disruption. And they, by the way, add to that disruption quite willingly and fully. And then finally, there's just the sheer anxiety that everybody has. By the way, that anxiety is not just on those who you're acquiring, in this case, American Airlines. It's also for those who are the acquired company because they're like, as U.S. Airways is saying, they're saying, wow, maybe I won't have a job when this gets all done, mm-hmm. even though we bought these guys. Yeah. So there's big problems everywhere. One of the first decisions that Parker has to make is who his leadership team is going to be. Right. And that seemed like it was fraught with all kinds of peril and sending all kinds of signals. Well, the leadership team decision is incredibly important because it is sort of your indication to the rest of the organization of how you're going to run this company. So additionally difficult here is because Doug had had a team around him uh, that had been with him as a leadership team since uh, the America West days. And they know each other very well. I mean, these were close, close friends. They would talk about it being a familial relationship amongst the five of them. And there were actually five gentlemen and, and then Elise Eberwine, who was the sort of the, the, the glue that held them all together because she was the disciplinarian, by the way, amongst this group. And she turns out to be one of the true stars of this story. Um, and, and Doug would be the first to tell you that he couldn't have done what he what was done here without her help. So you have this group of five that have been together forever, and yet they're now taking over American Airlines. And the question is, will you actually break up the group and uh, include other American Airlines executives, as would be uh, appropriate if you, this was going to be a merger? Mm. If it was going to be a takeover, eh, you wouldn't have to worry so much about that. Yeah, but it's obviously positioned as a merger, and so... They are looking at co-leadership. What are some of the pros and cons of, of doing that? And how do, you, how do you make it work, I guess? The place where they're really looking for co-leadership was how to lead the integration itself. The decision was, are you going to have an American Airlines person lead it or a U.S. Airways person lead it or co-leadership? Mm-hmm. And that decision is, speaks volumes to the, those uh, who are watching to say, well, if there's only going to be one leader and it's going to be a U.S. Airways leader, in this case it was going to be Robert Isom, who at the time was the U.S. Airways uh, head of operations, run the integration, everybody will say, well, fine, this is, we know what's happening here. This is going to be U.S. Airways taking over us. We're going to do everything U.S. Airways way. That's just the way it's going to be. If you have co-leaders, in this case Bev Goulet, who is a former uh, treasurer and uh, CFO at uh, American Airlines, and you have her be a co-leader, it's a way of saying, oh, good, look, see, we're going to actually decide what's best from both groups. On the one hand, that's a very positive message. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, it takes more time yeah. because now everything is the debate. And now every decision then becomes a question about is it the U.S. Airways way or the American Airlines way? But you have to make a decision at the end of the day. Like decisions have to be made. Right. Consultants get involved in these things inevitably. What's the role of the consultant in a situation like this? Usually it's uh, three things. One is pattern recognition, coming in and sort of being able to say, look, I can tell you what's going to happen this week and next week and the week after. And so let's just talk about what needs to get done given what's going to go on. And so just having a sense of it's base camp. I've climbed this mountain before. I don't quite know what the weather's going to be. I don't know how great a climbers you all are, but this is camp one, two, and three. Follow me. That's a little bit first role that we tend to play um, because we've done this before. And many managements haven't done transactions of this scale or this type. Two, we basically try and help 
staff some of the more core teams, the teams that are really central to the, you know, the value proposition that underlie the deal. There we could be deployed and be helpful and try and move things along. And third, we become the, the sort of honest broker, if you will, sometimes in these integration teams and that we can uh, not necessarily make the call because that's not what the role of the consultants. It is, though, to make sure that we have all the data uh, to actually enable the call to get made. So those are the th- major roles that we tend to play. Yeah. And does this start to get into some of the things that you would you know, tell a leader that they need to hear but but probably aren't told? <laughs> yes, we would be. This is where all the hidden truths come to play, yeah. right? So, for example, you know, Doug is taking over uh, this big, huge airline. He of uh, U.S. Airways was headquartered in Phoenix. Uh, American Airlines is probably no surprise to anybody headquartered in Dallas. And so the very first question is, how does Doug indicate by virtue of his own actions uh, the power of role modeling, if you will, which is an incredibly important part of the repertoire of a CEO and something, as I say in The Hidden Truth, that very few CEOs do well. Mm-hmm. And so Doug, one of his very first acts was to say, look it, I'm moving to Dallas. Not only am I moving to Dallas, here is where my kids are going to school, and here's what church I have joined. That was one of his first announcements. And all the people in Dallas went, oh, okay, now we understand. Yeah. He understands what it means to be in our in our environment. So very important role modeling. A second part of the book talks a lot about the fact that you are often, as a, as a leader, not told the entire truth. I tell this story that a, a, an admiral who used to be the head of the NATO Supreme Commander told me when he once goes onto a battleship, he knew two things with certainty when he got to the bridge. One, he would never be handed a cold cup of coffee, and he would never get the entire truth about what was happening on the boat. <laughs> and this is what CEOs, I think, need to understand, and certainly Doug came to understand, was that he wasn't going to get the full story about the quality and nature of, of the issues at American Airlines from one individual. That just wasn't going to happen. It required a fairly robust amount of reaching out to a large numbers of different peoples. That's where consultants can certainly help play as well. He also would talk to um, people who used to previously work for American Airlines, and he'd actually go and talk to others, even competitors, to talk about the truth really was of the uh, operations he was now inheriting. And I would imagine there's a, a fair amount of distrust particularly on the part of American Airlines. And that probably extends through the organization. A lot of things churning at this point and people are suspecting, you know, motives that, that maybe aren't there. Oh, absolutely. You, you can't imagine the amount of concern, uh, debate, uh, rumors that go on here. Uh, so part of the challenge that we spoke about earlier about keeping the focus on the base business, when all that is going on, it's really hard to go out and you know make the sales calls and ensure the planes arrive serviced and on time. There's the huge issue there, certainly. The other thing is to remember about these sorts of situations is that you're unable to uh, announce as a CEO your decisions. You're in this period where you've announced the deal, but you don't have legal close and you don't have regulatory approval. So you're not allowed to, because of FTC and justice rules, to say, this is what we plan to do. I mean, you can do some of that, but the lawyers, the regulatory lawyers would say, please do none of that. Because anything you do there could cause concerns, and now this case with the bankruptcy court and with regulators. So you're left as a a leader to have to talk about the process you're going to use to make decisions rather than the actual decisions. What are some of the mistakes that firms make when they're going through this process? Well, we've already covered one uh, in great detail, which is that losing the base business is really, uh, that's w- almost one of the key elements. The second is forgetting in some strange way why you did the deal. One of the th- first things I would often do when I was asked to join two CEOs and, uh, and talk about the transaction they're about to do, I would say, well, please tell me the reason you did the deal. And they'd all roll their eyes and go, my heavens, did you not even read the PR statements? And I said, of course I've read all that. That's not what I'm asking you. What is the real reason you did the deal? Not what you said publicly. What is it you're really trying to achieve here? Mm -hmm. And when you actually understood the real reasons for the deal, you have to make sure that your integration architecture matches that aspiration. So if you're a pharmaceutical firm buying another pharmaceutical firm, if you're really buying it for the R&D operations, then make sure that you are integrating the R&D operations in a thoughtful manner. So keeping focused on the real reason you did the deal was quite important. And here, the real reason for the deal was to get scale and get it fast and get it uh, into the marketplace. So operationally, you brought real effectiveness to the American Airlines system, which was missing. So that would be the second thing you really have to focus in on. And then most people really do undervalue the cultural challenges here, which are quite significant. 
not the least of which was American Airlines was just so much bigger than U.S. Airways and saw U.S. Airways as a little bit of a, you know, a vacation airline or, you know, not, not a serious airline, not the way they were. And, of course, the U.S. Airways people would say, look at those American Airlines people. All they care about is wealthy business leaders who can afford their inefficiencies. And we have just got to fix this thing. So how do you do that? How do you even broach something like that? Well, the first is to be transparent and open with each other. You do have this uh, differences of opinion. Doug Parker, when he came to class, which he was very kind to do, he said, look, we sort of – we thought they were crazy and they thought we were crazy. And we sort of <laughs> just had to sit back and say, look, at, we both can't be right. So let's try and better understand each other. So one was uh, transparency and openness is absolutely incredibly important. And there's another hidden truth you don't see enough of in communication and with uh, openness to your communication. So one – being open to and being willing to be challenged. That's something many CEOs are not willing to do. Doug said, look, it, I'm here to be challenged. Tell me where I'm wrong. Second, a lot of symbolic activity. One of the first acts Doug Parker did was he walked in with surprise to see security in the lobby. And he just said, look, this is silly. We don't need all this. So he took all that down. He did away with executive parking. He did away with the sort of executive dining rooms. He did away with this huge office structure that prevented the senior team from being seen by others. So he broke all those barriers literally physically down and said, look, I'm not your former management here. I'm a different management. The last thing he did was great. Many of you, your listeners will remember, American Airlines had this iconic silver airplanes, and they had decided to change what's called the livery, which is the entire look of the airline. And they'd spent a lot of money developing the new uh, look of the American Airlines. And Doug Parker said, look, before we go ahead with this, let's put this to a vote of the entire employee population. People were slightly aghast because they spent fortunes actually developing this new livery. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, no, I want us to see if this is one airline. So I'm going to put it to a vote. And, of course, the the new airline livery uh, was voted on positively, and that's why every American Airlines uh, plane now you see has this sort of white look and a different, much more up-to-date logo. Yeah, yeah. I liked the silver, but that's just my opinion. (laughs) Well, I'm sorry you would have been outvoted. I didn't get a vote. I was going to say so many of the things that he did, I would think, would make him a hero with the rank and file people, probably with the unions as well. But I would imagine it it would cause a lot of strain on the relationship with the management folks at American Airlines. And, you know, is that something that you have to address head on? Like, how do you tackle that? Well, it is inevitable. I mean, the, as you your opening suggested, there is a little bit of some Machiavellian elements to mergers and acquisitions. There's just no doubt that when you put two organizations together, certainly ones of this uh, scale, you have two corporate centers, which you don't need. So there are going to be people that were not going to be necessary for the going forward organization. That does mean choices have to get made and people will have to leave. That's unfortunate, but that's the reality of of just not needing two corporate centers. So clearly that was the first choice that was made. And there, Doug decided that he would keep his five close colleagues with him, with Lease, and that they would layer in a few American Airlines people to the most senior level. But that was, frankly, something he had decided early on. He was going to do this transaction if he couldn't do it with his team. And one of the reasons he did this transaction that he did was he could bring along his team. The first level of management reporting to Doug was pretty much the U.S. Airways team. But below that, it was probably much more equitable between the two airlines. And if anything, American Airlines people probably dominated because it's at that level where their skills were most necessary to have given the scale differences between the two airlines. And and some of the really hard decisions, I would imagine, come down to things like operations and technology systems and where are you going to place your bets on on those things? Huge issues. All the other airlines who had gone into bankruptcy had struggled to come out of bankruptcy without major troubles to their IT systems, to their operational systems, their reservation systems, and most importantly for most of the flyers, their frequent flyer programs. Mm -hmm. And so this became a huge issue going forward was how to actually come back out of the bankruptcy of American Airlines and now the merger with U.S. Airways with systems that were operative and not go down Several of the other airlines actually you know, had to stop um, operations for a day or two because their reservation systems failed. So we learned from the failure of others that had gone before us and made sure that we did the IT system change in a very slow, very methodical, very risk adversion based way. I'm probably not the one to be talking about the details of this, but the fact is that that was the fundamental view of the team 
And so it probably what would normally you would think to try and do in several, you know, a year to 18 months, some of the IT transitions uh, took as long as four to five years to make. Wow. David, this has been a great conversation as usual. Thank you for sharing your insights about this really interesting merger with us. I have one more question before we let you go. If there's one thing you want people to take away from this case and from the Hidden Truths book, what would that be? Well, I think the first thing is how difficult it really is to be a a new leader of a new organization. The whole Hidden Truths book talks about the challenge of doing that, particularly if you've not been a CEO before or a a leader before. You realize that all of the things you learn to do to get to that position and be given that opportunity to be a leader don't actually work, and they're not of that much value now that you're at that senior most uh, level position, and you have to learn a whole new set of skills. And so that hidden truth is something that should really motivate people. And certainly, Doug, in this case, because he had been a former CEO, uh, employed many of those approaches really well. The other important thing about mergers and acquisitions is to realize we talk a lot about corporate strategy here at Harvard. Well, corporate strategy these days, for the most part, always includes some sort of acquisition-oriented approach. And so it's a fundamental part of corporate strategy now to do mergers and to do acquisitions. This is a learned skill that we all have to develop because in today's world, organic growth alone is not going to be sufficient to drive the needs of shareholders. You have to also acquire. Yeah. Sounds like people would be lucky to have you on the merger team if they attempt to go down this path. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been just a joy to be with you. Thank you. If you enjoy Cold Call, you should check out our other podcasts from Harvard Business School, including After Hours, Skydeck, and Managing the Future of Work. Find them on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Thanks again for joining us. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School brought to you by the HBR Presents Network. <laughs>